longest increasing subsequence in a sequence is output in this sequence as well. So it's almost Sorry. Yeah, so it's, uh, as usual, it's nice to be here. And um, OK, so this is joint work with uh, C. Sashadri. And uh, also, I'm somewhat PowerPoint challenged. And most of the slides are his. So I appreciate his sharing them with me. And uh, what the plan for the talk is that I'll give a slide talk for like the first half. And then we'll take a break. And then if uh, people who want to hear the details can come back after the break and hear some details. OK. Um, all right, so the problem is kind of the obvious problem. So you have a, an array or a function uh, from the integers 1 through n to the natural numbers. You want to find the length of the longest increasing subsequence. OK, and um, n not consecutive, obviously. And um, so this is kind of a standard textbook problem in dynamic programming. Um, so the obvious dynamic program takes like n squared time, but there are n log n algorithms that it, have been known for a long time. Um, and uh, so there's been a lot of work studying this problem in different computational models, kind of exact computation. And then there's related stuff about um, in property testing. This is was studied for whether something, whether a sequence is completely sorted or not, you know, testing that. And that's actually, you know, uh, closely related to this problem. That you can think of the problem of estimating as kind of a generalization of the property testing framework. OK, uh, I guess the blue references are math CS papers, and the black references are actually practical papers where people are actually studying this. And I'll say that you know, the, our algorithm is fast, but not particularly practical, because as you'll see, the constant, there's a, there's a constant. It's pretty horrible. Um, all right, so. Um, <coughs> And you know, LIS is kind of a simple special case of the longest common subsequence problem. It's just asking for the longest common subsequence between your list and the sorted version of the list. OK. All right, so you know, the setting is that we've got a huge data set. Uh, we don't want to read all of it. And what can we say about the LIS length if we see very little? Um, so we read only, let's say, polylog n positions. And then somehow, by looking at that, we make some statement that the LIS is between 0.4 times the length of the array and 0.6. Now, you know, a lot of people, their reaction to this is, you know, typically, if you take a random array, then the LIS is only like root n. And so the answer in our case then will be 0, because we're not looking, we're, not, we're getting an additive approximation. Uh, so this is not so interesting for random arrays. The idea is that um, we're interested in the case where there is a significant longest increasing subsequence, and we're trying to estimate that length. <coughs> Um, and obviously, the algorithm has to be randomized. Uh, OK, and sort of the kind of a related, you can view it as a mathematical question is you know, how to locate a small portion of the array that tells you something significant about the LIS, and do such portions even exist? All right, so I mean, here's an array, and let's. You know, the first thing you try in these problems is to just sample uniformly. So you choose a random uniform sample of polylog n. Now, this particular array has, uh, is 2, 1, 4, 3, 6, 5, 8, 7. So it's just a bunch of transpositions in adjacent places. If you take a random sample, you will never pick two adjacent elements. So what you'll end up seeing is an increasing sequence. So 
So the LIS is only n over 2, but a random sample is completely increasing. And you know, you can divide this instead of blocks of size 2, you can block, divide it into blocks of size 10 and have the, each block of size 10 be decreasing. And you still have the same situation that your random sample will look completely increasing. But the LIS size is uh, you know, tiny. OK, so you know, our result is we want, the, we want the range to be small, some delta n. And uh, for any constant delta, we'll give an algorithm that gives an additive delta n approximation to the LIS. The running time is polylog in n with C of delta, and that C of delta is unpleasant. Uh, we didn't, we're not exactly sure what it is, because uh, the, the analysis is trying to optimize that parameter turns out to be harder than we expected at the moment. I mean, we think that it might lead to exponential in 1 over delta. I think it's more, it may be more like uh, you know, 1 over delta squared, or 2 to the 1 over delta squared, or something like that. What's the C here? This C? That C is not so bad. That C, I mean, again, we haven't tried to optimize it. But I mean, easily, it's less than 6. And if you spend some time on it, it's 2 or 3, I think. Maybe even one. I mean, if you really, if if we really work at it, maybe it's even one. Uh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Um, Now, the best previous is just delta equal a half. So there are existing algorithms which estimate it within a factor a half, which doesn't sound very impressive. But that's, not, that's kind of not fair to the previous results, because I'll tell you what they really proved. You, can, you deduce this from their algorithm, but their algorithm does something a little ni that looks nicer than, than this. This isn't wh what they were explicitly trying to do. Um, Okay, so what they were trying to do is if, if I, um, we have this parameter which we'll call the distance. It's the distance to monotonicity, which means if you look at, you ask how many positions do you need to change in this array to make it monotone? So that's the complement of the LIS. So that's these positions over there, okay, and so um, if the thing is close to being sorted, then there's a relatively small number of positions you need to change, and that's what we call the distance. Okay, uh, and so what those algorithms really gave was a two multiplicative approximation to distance, so that they gave an algorithm, or it's really two plus epsilon, that whatever the distance is. So if your thing is close to being sorted, we can estimate that to within a factor of two. OK. The problem is if it's not so close to being sorted, for example, if it only has an LIS of length n over 2, then the distance is 1 half. And then the, you know, a 2 approximation would give you 1. And so that's where you get the n over 2 thing. And in fact, their algorithms, as, as I'll show you later, um, can be that bad. The, the algorithm also improves this from 2 to n delta? Yeah. So, so our result is actually going to give a 1 plus delta approximation to distance for any constant delta. I'm not sure I understand the distance thing. Uh, how do you calculate distance? It's n minus the... It's just... N minus the longest? Thing divided, oh. normalized by the length. Okay. So, so all, yeah. Number of locations you need to delete and not replace. Not replace. Yeah, well, you could say delete or change. That's the way I like I mean, to think of it. Because then 17, 18, 19, you would have to fill them either with fractional numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said they're integers for convenience, but they don't have to be integers. So, okay. Uh, okay, so the plan for the talk is that first I'll sketch the two approximation algorithm. Uh, 
talk some about the obstacles to improving the algorithm. And then the two new main algorithmic ideas, although I can't, you know, they're not that new. They're just sort of, I guess they're twists on old ideas. Um, <coughs> then I'll give a sketch of the algorithm, and then we'll take a break. And then if time permits, uh, to the Blackboard for more details. All right, so the first thing is, you know, we're going to make use of this geometric picture all the time. You just plot the points of the array as points. So uh, you map the index x, and I'm going to use I'm going to use x for indices instead of i. So you know, index one gets mapped to the point one comma four in the usual way. All right, so if you if you do that, then um, you can sort of view the endpoints as points in the plane given as an array. And an increasing subsequence is then just uh, if you look at the partial order that you get by saying if one point is greater than another if it's above and to the right, then it's just a chain in that partial order. All right, and then there's a, a notion of what we call a violation. A violation is a pair of points which are out of order. Okay, so those, that pair of red points is called a violation. All right, and the main algorithmic component uh, that was kind of not explicitly used, stated in those other papers, but you know, it seems to be what, what people do, and it's kind of a natural approach, is a classification algorithm. So the classification algorithm takes as input a single, I, should, I said input, index, takes as input a single index and outputs good or bad. So it kind of classifies the points, but we're not going to class. We're not going to run this algorithm on, er, on every point. So let me tell you what the properties of this algorithm are. It should classify an index as good or bad. Good indices should form an increasing sequence. Okay. So what that means is, you know, the algorithm is going to, you know, in principle, will <coughs> enables you to classify every index, but you're not going to try it on every index. Okay. But but the algorithm must, the classification algorithm should have a promise that if you were to run it on every point, then the green points would form an increasing sequence. And the second is that not too many bad indices compared to distance, so that the number of points colored red should be a small multiple of the optimal distance. Okay. And then the, and then the classification of a single index should run very fast. So given the classification algorithm, then you can just choose a random sample of indices and run classify on each one and count the fraction of greens and I mean count the fraction of greens and reds, and that will give you an estimate to the LIS. Okay. Uh, so you output the fraction of indices that are classified as good. There, that's your estimate. Okay. Questions so far? To classify. So, you, I mean, you have the entire array sitting there, kind of there. You can access it. You have query access to the array. And then you give the algorithm index 17, and you say, is that, should I put that in my, in my increasing sequence or not? Yeah, so the algorithm has query access to the array. We'll, you, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. So um, what's going to happen? OK, let me give you, so here's what's going to happen. These algorithms are going to be randomized, OK? But what will happen is that you should think of the random coins for the algorithm. So the classification of good and bad will be randomized. But you should think of that the random coins for the algorithm are sort of, although we don't really do this, but conceptually, you should think of them as all being flipped in advance. Once you flip all the random coins, the behavior of this algorithm will be deterministic. Okay? Now, for different choices of coins, the labeling of good and bad will be different. But once you fix the coins, the promise is for that fixed setting of the coins, the good, this, that the, whatever you call good will be increasing. What will be random? <coughs> 
And where the randomness comes in is how big this red set will be. For some choices of the coin, things will be bad and the red set will be really big. But what we want is that with high probability over the coins, the red set won't be, won't be bigger than it needs to be. Okay. Okay. So the first thing when you think about this is, you know, I give you an index and I say, you know, I, I ask you about index 17. Is that good? And your algorithm has to say good or bad. It looks around a little bit. And then I ask you about index 53. Is that good or bad? Now, you know, when you make decisions, you don't know what I'm going to ask later. And you, you've got to somehow make sure that, you know, how are you going to ensure this condition that all the goods are increasing? Okay, that's, that's kind of a tough thing. So to ensure, here's one way of thinking about it. For any violation. Uh, you decide if someone is good or bad without looking at the, it's only a decision. Uh, so you no, 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 I mean, this is not, this is an algorithm. I mean, yeah, yeah. You're, you're running the algorithm, you get x. So the decision if x is good, I, uh, I do it only after I see all the other points that I'm going to, uh, to look at later no. or not. Well, you can. Your so algorithm, I'm just saying, yeah, no, this is the way this, the way this particular algorithm works. So here's the way this algorithm works. You get an index x. Based on x, you start querying some positions in the, in the array. And then you, know, you get to adaptively look. Your algorithm, you, know, you look at index x first, and you see the value at x is 28. Now you look at index x plus 1, and you see it's 33. So then you say, well, because of that, I'm going to look at 10 places ahead. And you look at that, and you do this for a while. And then at the end, you say, OK, this, this index is good. Yeah, that's my question is because uh, theoretically, maybe you don't have to decide if it's good, but you can wait until the end of the algorithm, and then you will decide if it's good. Yeah, I'm bad. saying the way, I'm, I, so what I'm saying is the way we, because of the way we want to use this algorithm, right? So we want this algorithm, we, um, so, Let me just, so for everybody else, let me say what the question is so that it's, it's clear because it's an important question and I, I, I'll clarify it. So, um, you know, we're going to run this classify algorithm on a bunch of points. And, you know, when I go to classify a particular point, you know, maybe I should wait to find out what else you're going to ask me to classify. That's what you're asking, right? Okay, but remember how we want to use the classify algorithm. This is really important. At the end, what we're going to do is we're going to run classify on random set of points, and then we're going to look at the fraction of ones that are classified as green and use that as our estimate of the LIS. So these better sort of be independent decisions, or else that, that whole method won't work. Yeah, Russell, I see you, so Paul. I get say you. that you have an imperfect classifier, good crime, say, okay, that mo defines a mostly increasing sequence. So Seem like intuitively what you could do is you you look at good prime for your input. If it's, if it's not good prime, it's not good. If it is good prime, you look sort of in a window that's of points that are close until you find some that are good prime, and you see if your value is consistent with those. You know, with the nearest neighbor on both sides. And if okay. you don't have any neighbors, then you're sort of in a sparse interval and you can just be deleted because. Okay. So let, let me keep going. And yes, you'll see. Uh, so you're suggesting an algorithmic approach. Right. Is that, yeah, okay, let's, let's see. Okay. Um, Paul. Yeah, no, I was just saying, I mean, if you, if you made it adaptive based on the questions that are being asked, it's trivial to make sure that good is always increasing. I mean, that's the, the I, I think. Right. No was, right, but you know, you so based on what was yeah, theory. but it's no, and you're not, and the reason why you're not is because yeah, yeah, right, right. we and, want. And that wouldn't be interesting, basically. Yeah, right. I mean, it wouldn't be useful for this particular yeah. thing. Okay. Okay. So here's what we have to. Do. If you have a violation, remember a violation is two points that are out of order. Then one way of looking at the requirement is you, your algorithm had better classify those as bad. So for every violation, you have to classify one of them as bad. 
Now, when I ask you about X, you know, it's involved in a whole bunch of violations. You don't know about those, which violations it's involved in at the moment. So, you know, if you classify X as good, then you've got to somehow guarantee that you classify all the things it has violations with as bad. Right? This is the, the problem. So, so there's a trick that goes back to a paper of Ergun, Kanan, Kumar, Rubenfeld, and Vishwanathan, which is kind of an easy trick, but very nice which is that if you have a violation, and if you look between the two points, then every point in between them has to be in violation with one or the other. Okay? Which means that if you look in this interval, either P of X is in violation with half the points in the interval, or P of Z is in violation with at least half the points in the interval. So that looks really nice because that's the kind of thing we can do statistics on, we can do sampling on. All right. So, so here's the basic algorithm. You start looking at intervals around X and you take a random sample. And you look at the intervals of different size. So you study samples in neighborhoods of P of X. And by a neighborhood, neighborhood can be any size. Um, and you say that little E should be an epsilon. If more than half minus epsilon violations in any neighborhood, then bad, else good. So you take this random sample and you just say, if this point is in violation with a close to half fraction in any one of these neighborhoods, then uh, we'll declare the point bad. And well, we, you know, we have to look at all neighborhoods, but we don't really. So you only have to look at logarithmically many neighborhoods by just taking kind of neighborhoods of size some 1 plus epsilon to the k. So the total number of neighborhoods you have to examine is order log n. And within each neighborhood, you uh, constant? Each neighborhood take a constant number of samples? Within each neighborhood, well, you know, you take like a logarithmic number of samples because you want to make sure that your estimate is, is good enough. Okay. All right. And so that's it. That, you know, that's pretty much. Yeah, go ahead. So inside each interval, you can't check all the pairs because the interval is too big. Well, not all pairs, but you fix your x. You look at an interval around x and see. You you look at first of all, you're going so you look at logarithmically many intervals, small ones, big ones, and then within each interval, you pick a random set of, say, log n points or log squared n, you know, to be safe, and then you uh, estimate the number of violations with x, and then you uh, throw away. Uh, you throw x away if it's in violation with close to half. Yeah. Um, no. So this is the okay. one where more than the half minus epsilon, epsilon, epsilon. So you're actually going to class the. But that's what each one is. Just no, one. so you're right. You're right. So this algorithm, this version of the algorithm. Is, you know, so I'm sim oversimplifying things, in such just because I'm just not present. I'm not talking about this algorithm. This is just warm up, but so what? So the algorithm I presented doesn't quite do what I said because. As Shahar suggests, um, it's, there's a chance that there's a, there's a pair of points where I classify both of them as good, even though they're both bad. And why? how could that happen? Well, I know that the interval between them, at least half the points are in violation. But maybe my sample is faulty. So I, take a, I happen to choose a bad sample. But if I'm choosing samples of size log squared n, the chance that I choose a bad sample is really tiny. So. That's true, and that's the way, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's the way you do it. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So you use, when you, sam when you choose an interval, you choose the sample, you use exactly the same sample in both. So this property is inherited by subsamples. So at least, so yeah, that's, that's exactly, I just uh, had a, a blind spot, could, didn't remember that, but yeah, okay. So assuming that the intervals are centered the same way. Yeah, and you can do that. You can do that. I mean, these are, te these are technical details. You, I mean, you can, 
basically, I think at this point, you could all go home and, and write the algorithm and make it work. This, this algorithm, OK? Uh, and now, we didn't do the analysis, but at least, you know, so we didn't prove that the factor of 2, but at least you can sort of see where the factor of 2 comes, because you're sort of, you might throw both of them away is the problem. So, you know, you, that, that's, you've got this, this interval, and, and in fact, this, this can happen. We'll see then that. So, I mean, that's the end of the description. So this is the, old, the algorithm of, uh, of uh, Parnas, Ron, and Rubenfeld, and of Elon, Chazelle, Commander, and Liu. Um, and, you know, look at this, the, the same array that we saw before which was this one with just transpositions. The problem is that when you look at the intervals of size 2 around each guy, you see a violation. You look next door and you see a violation. So you know, half of your interval is a violation. So the algorithm is going to throw everybody away. It's going to classify everybody as bad. Okay. Uh, now, of course, you, know, you can sit down and try to fix this problem for this particular example. But then you'll construct other examples where, you know, that are not so easy to fix. Okay. All right. So, you know, so now the question is, well, okay, so what can we do, you know, to try to what can we do? So, let's take a look at when we do classify, let's just look at a sort of a a very abstract picture of what the algorithm is doing. The algorithm is choosing from x, it's going to choose a random sample of points. But it's not a uniform random sample over everything. What does the random sample look like? Well, the random sample, if you think about it, as you move out, you have these intervals of, largest, of, large, of increasing density, exponentially increasing size, excuse me. And each one you sample uniformly. So your sample is going to kind of have this sort of decay property. As you go, for, and it's a very natural thing to do. We, if you were to think about what kind of sample would you want to take in order to classify X, even without knowing this algorithm, this is this is the sample that you'd want to do. Somehow, you know, yeah, this is going to do it. Okay. So we we'll call this kind of thing a neighborhood sample around X. This kind of exponential decay. So let's just start from this. You have the neighborhood sample around X. Can you use neighborhood samples more effectively to classify X? Okay. Well, here's an example. So you got to study this example for a minute. J here is the name of the region. Otherwise, K are, are integers. Okay. So in both examples, the first let's well let's look at example one first. The thing starts with an increasing sequence of length K. Then the next 2K consists of two increasing, interleaved in increasing sequences, which alternate. Small, big, small, big, small, big, where that one is an extension of this. And then the last is 2K, which is an extension of this one. Okay? So what's the length of the longest increasing sequence in this? 3K. You start here and you go up. Okay? Now, the other one starts out exactly the same, except on the right-hand side, instead of having an increasing sequence of length k, it looks like this. It's, got, it's divided into blocks of size 10. And each block of size 10, or 100, or whatever it is, is decreasing. But then it's increasing otherwise. OK? Example clear? Any questions on the two? So, so 2K refers to the number of elements? Number of points. No, number of points. Just yeah. number, of, number of indices that are okay, in this read. OK. So in the first example, the LIS is in 3K. But now notice, suppose you include any point here. <coughs> if you include any point here, then your LIS has size 2K. You're limited. So once you include a point over here, you, you lose K points out of your LIS. Now, look at the second one. Second example, the LIS is 2K. OK, but if you exclude. Once, if I were to use this point, 
then I can't, then, then all these points are forbidden. Oh, oh, because remember, this, the last strip is not an increasing sequence of length 2k. It's a decreasing, it's a, it's, it's 2k over 10. It's 2K over 10. All right. Uh, so if you exclude all the points in J, if you're, if you don't use any points in J, then the best you're going to do is K or K plus, you know, K over 10 or something like this. Okay. All right. Now, what does that, what does that mean as far as trying to do a classify algorithm? If I give you this point, how are you going to decide what to do? Well, the decision about what to do, if you take a neighborhood sample of this guy, when you get out to here, you will not be able to tell the difference between that part and that part. So somehow, local information very far away from x is critical for classifying x. All right. I will say, when we discovered this, when we thought of these examples, we kind of got a little discouraged about this problem because. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you mean when you sample far away, you also have to sample small intervals? It looks like, yeah, yeah. this is it. I mean, in this, in this case, at least you can't. So the sample that you need can't just be this. Okay. Okay. Maybe it can be k in another k. Pardon me? If it's just a few points far away, then around them should uh, like something. Yeah, now the problem is, though, this kind of behavior can happen at different scales. So what I'm saying is, you know, you can have, so imagine a, a tree. Uh, imagine an input which is, you know, in, in arranged in a tree, uh, like a, and it's a dairy tree. Okay, so what happens is, it, label each node as either um, increasing or decreasing. When I label the node as increasing, I mean that its children, its children each represent a block, and the block can either be increasing or decreasing. So you know, I'm saying this in a clumsy way. What I'm saying is you could divide things up into uh, blocks of blocks. Okay, so you first divide it up into blocks, then you divide it up, that into blocks. Each small block is increasing. Each middle level block, the, the, blo the middle level blocks are decreasing. And then the big blocks are increasing. Okay, and if you do that kind of thing, then you have to somehow be able to explore not only things far away, but on all different scales, okay? And that's, so th that's what seems to be, you know, a problem when you, when you get into this. Okay. Okay, so uh, here we go. So now I'm, d I'm just going to start with some of the ideas that we were trying to use to get this thing to work. So, I mean, this thing is a dynamic program, but here's a, here is a way of doing the dynamic program. So let's cut the thing in half. Uh, look at the closest LIS point. So we don't know this, but this is just a thought experiment. Take the LIS point, which is closest to the left, <coughs> and cut the thing har uh, har um, vertically. vertically. Well, you're cutting it with a horizontal line. You're cutting. OK? All right. And now look at the following. So we'll call that intersection point a splitter. And now notice that when you do that, then the LIS of the whole thing is equal to the lar LIS on the left plus the LIS on the right. OK? So all right, that's fine. But of course, we don't know this splitter. So we, tr you know, in if we were doing kind of, if we didn't care about time, then we could, uh, you try all possible splitters. There are n different choices. And so you try another one and you split it and you find, and okay, so now what do you do? So you look over all the n different choices and you compute the LIS in the box there and plus the LIS in the box there. You add them up and you take the maximum over all the possible line choices. And that's dynamic programming, a sim very simple dynamic program. Of course, then you have to solve the LIS problem on these smaller ones. 
but you could do, but what that means is that you can sort of build things up. You look at all boxes, and by computing the boxes, you, you build things up. Okay, so, you know, if you look at this from the recursive point of view, this is, looks like Savage's algorithm for those, most, for those of you who know it, for uh, directed SD connectivity um, it, that's in small space. But we're not trying to do this in small space. You could, you know, imagine this thing then as some dynamic program, you know, but it's not, it's not the, the best dynamic program, but it's a dynamic program. Uh, okay, but, but it's a conceptualization that we want to try to approximate in sublinear time. All right, so that's one idea is to try to mimic this dynamic program. Okay, now let's make an observation about uniform random sampling. We saw that random sampling can give a very bad estimate to the LIS, but random sampling is not useless for, for the LIS because what it does, the, essential, the errors are essentially one-sided, okay? That is to say, you know, if the LIS has size 0.3, then when you take your random sample, you will, you will see, you will choose about that fraction of that, of the right fraction of that LIS. So you get an LIS of at least 0.3. So uniform random sample gives us an approximate upper bound. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, an approximate upper bound on the LIS. So the hard part is to determine lower bounds on the LIS. So how do you, the problem, when we did random sampling, the problem was that it looked completely sorted, when, our sample, but in fact it wasn't. That was, the, the, you look puzzled, Paul. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to, I mean, right, so I mean obviously you can see sorted. Why, why is the, oh, okay, right. I mean, since you can get an upper bound, yeah, yeah, yeah. then the hard part, the only thing left is to get a lower bound. All right, so, you know, we were thinking about this and saying, okay, well, if you can't solve the problem that you're given, then weaken the problem that you're trying to solve. And so now we started looking at interactive proofs. So, you know, just to remind you, you have a powerful but possibly dishonest prover who claims that the LIS length is lambda n, okay? And his goal is to quickly convince us that the LIS is at least lambda minus epsilon n. All right, so let's see how this, how, how we can do this. So. We asked, I mean, here is an interactive proof, the first attempt, not a very good one. Ask the prover to classify an index as good or bad. Um, so you ask, the, the prover knows everything. So just ask him to classify. Is it in the LIS or not? Okay, and pick a random sample and just check that the fraction are good, right? So, you know, is, you're basically asking if it's in on the LIS, but of course, this honor prover could mislead us into overestimating the LIS the same way that a random sample can mislead us because you know if there if if we're in one of those examples where a random sample is completely sorted then this prover will just say that's in that's in that's in every time okay so so now let's look at it this way so here's this point we want to know is on the LIS and um, that's my question but I'm not going to tell the prover the point that I want to know so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that secret. And you're asking to choose one LIS because may, maybe there are many? Or? Yes, he should choose one. Yeah, yeah. So I ask him to choose, to, to, to fix one, have it in mind. And I ask him, you know, and the question I want to answer is this. But if I ask him directly, he might lie to me. So here's what I ask instead. I say, where's the splitter for the, where? In other words, where is the point on this n over two line where, so the prover says it's there. Okay, so the LA is, now once I know that, then I know that this point is bad. There's nothing, whoops. So I know the point's not on the LAS, so I classify it as bad. Okay, no, okay, we have this. So if the point was over there, yeah. No, 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 but I, I have this point in mind, right? I picked a point initially. So I just tell him the region that 
my point is in at that point, which is effectively like randomly choosing it. I didn't have to actually have a point in mind. Then I would randomly choose it, yeah, um, according to this. OK, so again, you know, I, what's the splitter? He tells me there, and then how about this region? OK, so <coughs> there we go. Now what do we do if at the end of all this we keep going until we get down to a, you know, one, a region of one, and if the point is there, then I say, uh, then I color it, then I call it good. Otherwise, I call it bad. Okay, now, so if the point stays in the blue region until the end, then it's good. And now here's the key thing, and again, this is, I won't prove this to you, but it's kind of easy to prove by induction that lies by the prover only decrease the chance that good. Remember, we're only worried about him lying of, of, proving, of trying to convince us that the LIS is too big. We're not worried about him proving that the LIS is too small because we can check that ourselves by random sampling. I don't think you're able to. So you're asking him about the specific point. In right, the and then I'll do, it a bunch, I'll do it a bunch of times. So the point about this is what we're asking is what's the chance he can make me say good? Okay, okay. and the claim is the chance that he will, for a random point, the chance that he'll make me say good is no more than the fraction of the LIS. In other words, that the, the best thing he can do is to actually answer honestly, give me the honest splitters. And it's clear what happens is if he gives me the wrong splitter, then you're splitting into two boxes which give you a substandard LIS. I mean, it's not giving you the right LIS. And so kind of inductively from then on, he's trapped into, he's, you know, into a smaller situation. Um, that, uh, that doesn't look convincing to people, but so trust me, if you write it down, it's, it's not hard to show. Yes? If you have, you know, inductively, so the maximum chance on the left is the best longest increasing sequence on the, in the left box, right. the lower left box. Yeah. The best on the right is the one that starts in the right hand box. Any two such sequences form the longest increasing sequence in the whole No, 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 sorry. This point, this point is secret. This is the point. I generate this point at random and I hide it from the prover. I never tell him the point. I never tell him the point. Right, and the only thing I tell him is when he tells me the splitter, you know, I then tell him, okay, now let's go to this, this region. I pick the region that my point is in. Pardon me? This sampling that you described earlier, it sort of has that flavor of unit. The flavor of? When you're looking at the interval of size n, then n over 2, n over 4, n over 8. Yes, and then it has some, a. There's some similarity to sort of sampling of intervals that you. Of, 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 no, but I can't hear. Sampling of intervals that you had in the, in the earlier algorithm. I see. Yeah, I mean, yes, there's some similarity. Okay. It's a, I mean, it's a, unless your pointer is yeah, just for the, you know, everything might be to the, to the left if you just, uh, you know, depending on your region, you might be a little in all the different sides. Okay. So it takes only log n steps. That's nice. But, but th th there's this prover. That's the only catch. Okay. So now the question is, can the algorithms, can an algorithm simulate the prover? Well, I mean, he, the algorithm doesn't know the LIS, so we can't simulate the prover. But, you know, there's a notion of an approximate splitter, which is, it's a, it's a splitter which loses only a few points of the LIS. Okay, so, you know, suppose that the prover, that the prover, instead of giving me the exact splitter, he gave me an approximate splitter every time. So there's a little bit of loss every time. But I have some, you know, I, that's, I do have some tolerance. Okay, so 
you know, as long as I don't lose too many points each time, uh, at most mu n, whatever mu is going to be some parameter, we'll see, then uh, we're okay. Okay, so again, you lose mu n over two points. But you have to sort of, if you lose mu points, you're, you're also losing mu points on the right, even though you're not there. But you, you would be losing it if you were there. So we lose a mu fraction of LIS points at each round. So the total loss there at log n rounds will be something like mu n log n. So if we set mu to be something like 1 over 100 log n, then the total loss is n over 100. So that's good. That's, that's, that's within what we're trying to do. Okay, how do we find approximate splitters? So th that's uh, Sesh's um, contribution here. So um, Russia, be conservative. So what do we do? Um, so a conservative splitter, see, we don't know. I have a splitter and I want to make sure that it doesn't eliminate, that it eliminates <coughs> few points from the LIS, but I don't know what the LIS is. So let me just make sure that it eliminates few points. It just has few violations. So if I can find a point which has at most mu times n violations overall, just the number of violations, then I certainly know that it has at most mu n violations with the LIS. So a conservative splitter is definitely an approximate splitter. So how do we check whether a point gives a conservative splitter? Well, that's just random sampling. OK, so that's, that's not a problem. You just take a random sample. You see the fraction of points that it violates. Um, is there an equal factory exchange? Yeah. OK. So fine. So with this, we can simulate the prover. Um, we can now to find the splitter, we just select a random sample of log n candidates. So again, I just want to be clear, when you sample this thing, you only have access to the x coordinates, right? Everything's accessed. So you take a random sample of x coordinates, you get the corresponding y coordinates, and those will be that's your that's how you random, that's the only way is this indirect sampling of the y coordinates. Okay? Um, so, I mean, you might miss a conservative splitter, but as, as no gas, what if no such splitter exists? Okay. So, okay, what do you, what do you do? So, that leads to the second idea that we have. Um, so, too many times, what's that? This will not happen too many times because otherwise. Uh, the That's true. Small yeah. Okay. So, no splitter. So, so, suppose every point is in violation. Uh, with at least n over 100 points. Wait, what is the definition of conservative splitter? A uh, conservative splitter was one, was a point <coughs> with the property uh, that, it, that the total number of violations overall you take this point and now those black points represent every point that's in violation with this point. So, you know, I'm trying to find a point which is in violation with few things on the LIS. Instead, I take a point which is in violation with just few things. Okay? Obviously, that's good enough. Okay? But the problem is there may not be any such points. Okay. So what happens if there's no such points? So if there is no such splitter, then if you choose any horizontal line, then the number of points in the white region is at least mu n, and that's true for every such thing. So we know that the LIS, well, the LIS has to be less than 1 minus mu n because the true splitter loses those mu n points as well. Okay, so this leads to the next idea, which is boosting approximations. And I'll, so suppose I give you an additive delta approximation algorithm, and delta prime is less than delta. So I want to get a delta prime n approximation algorithm. So I want to improve you know, from a third to a quarter or something like this. OK. 
So suppose we had the real splitter for the moment. If I, if I had my hands on the real splitter, I run the, the weaker approximation algorithm on the left box and on the right box. So that gets me a delta approximation. Remember, delta prime is less than delta. So the LIS is this and the estimate. The total estimate is just, you know, you get this estimate. We know the estimate is within delta N1 of the estimate on the left. And on the right, it's within a delta fraction. So if I add up the estimates, then the estimate is within a delta fraction of uh, N1 plus N2. OK? Wait, how do you get it? Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I, I forgot to say something. I, yeah. How, How do you get a two-sided bound? Recursive. Oh, that's your assumption about the recursive. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Now, N1. Yeah. So N1 is the number is not the number of indices. It's not that N1 plus N2. N1 is not N over two. N1 is the actual number of indices whose value falls in the blue box. So N1 plus, so what happens is estimate minus LIS, the, the error is delta times the sum of N1 plus N2. But N1 plus N2 is less by a factor of 1 minus mu. Okay? So that means that instead of getting a delta approximation, we're getting a delta times the 1 minus mu approximation. Okay? So that's, that's nice. That means we can boost the thing. And uh, so putting it together, um, now, oh, sorry. So this is if we knew the real splitter. But we don't know the real splitter. But we can just guess it, meaning we take a, a polylog and sample candidates for splitters. And for each one of them, we do this. Now, notice that, uh, so you check if e if each is a conservative splitter. If any one of those is a conservative splitter, we're done. I mean done, we, we can proceed with the first idea. And otherwise, one of these is close enough to the best splitter. So for each one, we do the recursive algorithm. That's gonna be, that's gonna mean that the number of recursive calls I'm gonna have is going to be, for each splitter candidate, I have two recursive calls. So I get two poly, but it's polylog because I have polylog splitter candidates. So I take those polylog splitter candidates, I run the recursive calls. And so I have polylog n calls to the weaker approximation algorithm. Um, and I take the, and then I just take the best one. All right. So, um, okay, and that looks very much like what you do in the, in the dynamic, original dynamic programming that was, program we were talking about. So that takes you from delta to one, delta times one minus mu, and you recurse to keep improving the approximation. Uh, to recurse, won't you have to do this polylog search inside each small box? Uh, yeah. So now there's a problem. Uh, so, you know, we have delta zero is delta one times one minus mu, and then you split into these algorithms. Now, suppose we even just had to do two recursive and calls. What's the half? The, um, half the, the half is the trivial, the, the known algorithm. Okay, delta is equals a half. So we're aiming for delta zero, which is one over a hundred. We have a one half algorithm. And suppose you even just had to do two recursive calls. We don't have to do two. We have to do poly log n recursive calls. But even two recursive calls. So you do the recursive calls to go to delta one and then delta two. So the depth of this tree is going to be, you know, it, the approximation gets better by one minus mu. Um, so let's say we just want to go from a half to a quarter. So then we need t to be something like one over mu. Um, and the running time is at least two to the one over mu because it's the number of leaves of this thing. So mu had better be something like one over log log n better be bigger than that, okay? But then remember that for the approximate splitter, we needed mu to be less than one over log n. All right, so 
it looks close, you know. So, okay. So the hope for dichotomy is that you either we find a splitter and continue the interactive proof, or we can find a splitter, and then we do the dynamic programming phase. So we either have, but for the interactive proof, we need mu to be less than, I said, what it says one over log n, but one over 100 log n. And for the dynamic program, we need mu to be bigger than one over log log n. Um, sorry. And again, the reason why we have this dichotomy is we get an error of mu times n at each level of the interactive proof. So we have to keep mu small. And for this, we, get, we, have, we want mu big because um, we don't want the number of recursive levels to be too much or else that the, the size of this recursion blows up. What's that again? Oh, well, I'm sorry. This is the hope for dichotomy is that either this or this. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is just, a, a, you know, reminding you what happened. What, what, you know, why the, why the dichotomy fails. That's the, maybe that's the better s title for this slide is why the dichotomy fails. Okay. All right. So what do we try to do next? Well, we look at the thing on the left and we try to kind of weaken things a bit. And we look at the thing on the right, and we try to strengthen things a bit. And we hope to bring the muse together. Yeah. If I remember correctly, it seems it never worked. So. <laughs> yeah, it never worked, but it worked. <laughs> this is the thing. OK. So let's go back to this dynamic programming thing. If no splitter, then only 1 minus mu s points in any division. OK, so we take the maximum over all possible sums. So we look for this one splitter. And then you just try, if, there, if none of these guys was a good splitter, meaning that there was a large number of violations, that's that this white region ha had lots of points, and that's true for every one of these, then we just you know, solve here, solve here. Okay. So you, know, you think about it, well, you know, if you think about what other things you can do along these lines, well, you can divide things up into more regions. All right. So let's do it. So you know that blue region represents where the true LIS lies. Okay. So what we do is we you know we have a now we're, we don't look choose one splitter but we choose this it happens to be this number, okay of of splitters, and that they, these are just points which are consistent with the true LIS. Wait, what what is, is S? S? Oh 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 S is now the length of this box. So S is the number of S is the, S is the new N. S is the new N. That's right, because you're you're doing this recursively on all boxes. So S is just happens to be the number of indices. No, okay. All right. So you get this kind of chain of boxes, and now suppose we have a similar situation. Every chain of boxes has at most. 1 <coughs> minus mu times s points. Now notice, I want you to see that that's a weaker condition. Because before, when you look at chains of two boxes here, we're just asking that you have at least mu n points, or mu times s points, in this whole white region. The white region is huge. So you know, that's, you got more, ch at least seems that, you know, intuitively that you have more chance that that's going to work out. Yeah, let's, yes, that's true. Uh, so the number of points outside is at least mu s. So we run a delta approximation in each box. Wait, I, I, so, I, I, so do you run a delta approximation in each box, or do you do a random sampling of boxes? Just uh, 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 bear with me. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm coming at this in a slightly impressionistic way, but it, it'll, it'll come together, it'll come together in, in focus in a moment, okay? Uh, so you find the chain with the largest sum of estimates, okay? So you could do this for all the chains, all right, but as Paul says, there's lots of chains, and then we'll get this delta times one minus mu approximation, but there are more, lots of chains, I mean, huge number of chains. 
So what do you do? It's dynamic programming. It's a dynamic program. How many boxes, potential boxes, are there? Only polylog n potential boxes. Because every potential box, if you look at every possible chain, every potential box is just some you know, uh, consecutive block of these guys. And so, you know, this is log, and th this, lo this is log n, and this is log squared n uh, <coughs> vertical divisions. So, you know, there's a total of log n times log squared n times log to the sixth n, something like that, uh, different boxes, okay? So you run it on, run the delta approximation on all those boxes, but it's still polylog. And then solve a dynamic programming exactly because it's a dynamic program. You know, what are you doing? It's just a, it's just a, a longest path problem. Yeah. You put an edge between this point and this point, which is labeled by your estimate of the LIS here, and you do that, and then you just find the longest path from this point to that point. And you solve it just exactly. It's a polylog n size dynamic program which you can solve. Okay, so um, so that's good. So so that's how we are going to improve the right hand side. And I have to say something about how we're going to improve the left hand side. And we're actually going to improve the left hand side by using an old idea by recycling the original idea of neighborhood sampling from before, okay? But, so we're gonna make a few changes. First of all, we're going to allow splitters that are off-center, but not too close to either end. And by not too close, they can still be pretty close. You know, they shouldn't be closer than one over 100 or something like that to the, to the end. So they should be between one over 100 and 99 over 100. Now, the point is that, you know, as long as the splitter is not too close to either end, the depth of the recursion of this, you know, of the interactive proof will still be logarithmic. Okay. Well, Off-center with respect to these new boxes, which now are one over polylog n width? Don't worry about those boxes at the moment. Okay. 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 Just, we're still, no, we're just looking for a single splitter. A single splitter. Single splitter. Just, but any, you know, just... Instead of putting it at the end of our two point, we're putting it anywhere, okay? Except at the very end, okay? The other thing that it just turns out to be more convenient to do is that since, um, since we now allow the splitter to be anywhere, we'll take the splitter itself to be an input, to be an input point, okay? So in other words, before we took the splitter to be, you know, it was the n over two coordinate and then it was some vertical thing, but that was not necessarily the input point at n over 2. But now I can just, you know, take it anywhere. So you should think of it as that you're just going to look among the splitters. I'm uh, sorry, you're going to look among the input points in this range from 0.01n to 0.99n, and you're going to decide on one of them being in the LIS. Okay? What's that? What was your guess for a splitter before? It was always some point of failure. No, 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 it wasn't a point because, you know, we were always, before we were always taking the splitter to be at the n over 2 element. What I'm saying is it was always, it always had x coordinate n over 2 and it had some y, the y coordinate belonged <laughs> to some other point. Yeah, but now I'm actually saying that the splitter will be, you know, x comma f of x. Okay, that's not, that's just a, that's mostly a technical convenience. It's not, it's not really essential. Okay, all right, so now we'll define what we mean by a good splitter. We're going to modify the definition. All right, so, so mu w is, it's a mu w splitter if for all indices z. So I, I should have, this is a slide I made and I can't draw pictures. I needed Sesh to draw a picture of this one. But I'll draw it in the air. So you have x here, and you have z over here, OK? And um, 
let's see. You look within the interval xz, and you see how many violations are there with x in this interval. Okay? So before we only looked at all the violations with x, but now we look at violations of x in different size intervals. So we look at an interval, and we want it to be within a mu fraction of the length of that interval. Okay? And then plus uh, an additive error w. Okay? And that additive error w we will adjust. Now, I, I have to, this is only at the top recursive level. At lower recursive levels, we replace this x minus z by, you know, now you're in a box, and not all indices have their value in that box. So then you would replace this x minus z by just the number of indices that are relevant to this box. Okay, so you want, it's basically generalizing. Before we wanted a mu fraction of, of the x to be involved with a mu fraction of violations. Now we want, for every interval, x should be involved with a mu fraction of violations in that interval. Now, you have this additive, this additive error term which will be about n over log n, and mu will be a small constant. And we can search for x and check this condition approximately by random sampling. You just have to think about it. You kind of, you know, you look for x randomly. You don't have to check every z. You just have to check a random set of z's. Um, and then checking the condition, you can check randomly. Okay. But now if you look at what's involved in checking this, what you're really looking at is a neighborhood sample of x, because you're checking all the intervals around x. And within each interval around x, you want to have a, you know, something like a random sample. Yes? So you don't even need a neighborhood sample. A uniform sample would be fine, because w is, handles all small intervals. That's true. That's true. OK. Yeah, so I mean, it's very similar in spirit to what was going on in the classify algorithm. Um, okay. So again, all we're doing, I just want to back up. Before we were looking for a splitter, and the idea of a splitter was it was a point that we could divide the thing into two, <coughs> into two pieces, in, 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 and it would be good enough for doing the interactive proof, you know, so that. And what we said was, well, uh, our first guess was you just take a point which was a conservative splitter, which meant that it had few violations anywhere. And the problem was that the few violations, the definition of few, had to be one over logarithmic. Okay. Now, by requiring something that looks stronger, because we want not only it has few violations overall, but it has few violations in every interval, but the notion of few, can, we can afford to raise the notion of few so that mu can be a constant instead of, um, okay. So the key point is instead of requiring a mu equal order of one over log n, we just need mu small enough constant and w to be order n over log n. Okay, so now the dichotomy again. If we're unable to find an improved splitter, just a single improved splitter, but remember, we're now looking for splitters everywhere throughout the entire uh, thing, except at the very ends. If you're unable to find an improved splitter, then build a grid. And now we have this dichotomy lemma. If no mu w splitter exists, now here I replaced s by w. Or actually, <laughs> s over log n became w. So w is the width of this thing. Of, of this thing. And the dichotomy lemma says if no mu w splitter exists, then for every chain in this thing, there must be mu n chain points off the chain. Okay. okay, and then we can find a delta times 1 minus mu approximation for the LIS in the box. So um, I'm still slightly confused. Okay. You're only looking for splitters in regions that are closer 
closer, further from the end than W, right? Uh, if I've got this right? Um. Because yours is <coughs> W is one over log n the size of the box. That's true. Or one, yeah. That's right. So you might miss some splitters. There could be some guys that, um, that are mu w splitters, but they're sitting over here. Okay, but that doesn't destroy the lemma. Because, uh, because you're only multiplying that n over log n size w by log n, you know, epsilon log n or each of, so. Uh, I'm well, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to say it. it will, so when so I'm almost done with this part, I will actually show you that I can show you the proof of the dichotomy lemma, which, which takes into account that there's this noise, which is that there are these guys. See, I mean, there are splitters you're going to miss for two reasons. One is there might be splitters over here and over here. But then when you randomly look for a splitter, you're only randomly looking. You might miss a splitter just because it's there. But it's, so th there's you know, some number of splitters sprinkled out around. So there's a total number of splitters that you missed, but it's small. Okay, and the dichotomy lemma says that even though there's a small number of splitters you might have missed, uh, yeah, so I, I, I see. This is not, this is an imprecise thing. So if the number of mu w splitters is tiny, that's really what it says. So actually, isn't, isn't any point in the last work about some mu w splitter? Because w is the additive error. So once you, once you give w additive error, that's the maximum number of points you can have on well, no, because you take this point and you have to look at intervals going in both directions. So, I mean, if I take this point and I check if it's a, a splitter, then, you know, I have to check for every z, which includes z out here, whether its interval is. So to make it precise, no mu w splitter was found by the algorithm. Then That's right. So what, what we really show is that, um, OK, the, the, the precise statement is this. It's in, if you tell me how many mu w splitters there are, if you give me an upper bound on the number of mu w splitters, then no chain has more than this plus an error term, which depends on the number of splitters that there might be. Okay? So this, this, out, this thing has an additive term, which depends on the number of splitters that there were. Okay, so you just keep that small relative to mu n, and then you're okay. All right. So here's the algorithm. The classify algorithm. Uh, if we find a splitter, so you take a point. So this is classify. You know, I say continue the IP, but there's no IP anymore. The IP is just a, you know, it's just a mental fiction. So you take a point, you look for a splitter, but the splitter doesn't have to be right in the middle. It can be somewhere. Okay. Um, you find the splitter and then um, continue. And if not, if you can't find a splitter, that's at some point, then what you do is you divide, divide things up, solve all these polylog n Make polylog n calls to the delta approximation. Solve a polylog n size dynamic program. Okay, now there's one last step, which is you see, we're trying to do classify. So now we have chosen this as the best chain recursively. And, you know, P of x is sitting somewhere. Again, if P of x lies out here, we can just call P of x bad. If P of x lies in this box, then at that point we call classify recursively on that box. Now, classify has the same approximation parameter delta. So we call classify on that box with the parameter delta. Um, okay. So that's it. Uh, we get, now, the running time of this algorithm is not quite what I promised. It's log n to the 1 over delta. And the reason why, it, well, c over delta. And the reason is that um, the depth of the recursion is like one over delta, but at each level, you have to, you're, you're branching out by log n factor. So you get log n to the branching factor. So it is poly log, but the exponent depends on delta, and that's not what we want. 
So here's just in one slide the better version. Don't s so you get to this. You don't have to solve this dynamic program exactly. So this dynamic program actually is a problem, can be converted into a problem of the same form of the whole thing we're solving. So you can use our sublinear time algorithm to approximately solve this in log log n time, and then you can apply it recursively. OK, now, this sounds like a horrendous mess. Um, but the nice thing is that when you actually implement it, if you think through the implementation, recursion is a, is a ment was the mental picture that we had to develop it, but the recursion never actually appears in the implementation. And in fact, all you do is you run the entire basic algorithm and you just modify the parameters <laughs> as you go. By parameters, there's this mu parameter and there's this w parameter. And I treated those as static parameters. But what happens really is that if you let them dynamically vary in a very specific way, then it sort of implements the recursion for you. The reason being that you know, what happens when you go into this dynamic program, what's happened? You couldn't find a good enough splitter. Think of mu as fixed, and you were looking for a mu w splitter for a particular w. Now, now w was, what was like uh, n over log n, the length divided by log n. Now, in this thing, this is a log n size thing. So when you try to implement this recursively, you're going to look for a mu w splitter where w is 1 over log log n. So you're, just, you're back to looking for <coughs> splitters again, but with a smaller w. So, but then you didn't, even, you didn't have to draw this picture. You didn't have to create it. You didn't have to do the recursion. You could just you know, relax, go back and say, if you fail to find a splitter that's w for 1 over log n, then increase it to 1 over log log n. And you have to do some other changes. <coughs> but everything can be done in that way by just jiggling with the parameters. OK. And the running time is the c of delta log n to the c. Um, uh, OK, so what next? Um, so we get this. And c, our c of delta <coughs> is at least some constant to the 1 over delta. It might be k to the 1 over delta squared, or, or you know, I'm not sure. But uh, the best lower bound is log n over delta, which is in the, that's in the Elon uh, Chazelle Commander Liu paper. What they really show is that it's that hard just to tell the difference between an array being completely sorted and an array having being delta distance away from being sorted. So just separating those two requires log n over delta. OK. Uh, I mean, can you use this on other dynamic programs? There seem to be real barriers. There's something very special about this program that allows us to do this. OK. So all right. So you know, I'm not sure exactly what to show you, but I will uh, at least show you this dichotomy lemma, which is not very difficult, but it's just, you know, you just have to state it clearly and, you know, OK. So we have uh, what I'll call phi, which is, I'll use this notation. It's a chain of boxes. And uh, you know, it's that picture that we had. And um, we have this universe. This is U, and it, this is, you know, we'll call it spanning U. <coughs> okay, and then let's let. C be the union of everything. Um, and remember, we had the p function, so you know, uh, you know, for you know, index x, p 
of x equals the point associated to x. P of x may or may not be in one of these boxes. Just okay. Um, and uh, okay, so I mean, X may not even, U is some subbox. So, you know, X may not even be inside the box. So P inverse U is the set of X's which are inside the box. And then I will define, you know, phi of X. So phi was the name of this chain. So it's this box here, which is the box wh whose interval, so phi of X equals the box CI so that x is an element of, and now I'm making up notation as I go along, x of ci means equals the uh, set of x coordinates of uh, indices uh, in ci, where I where I'm misusing notation by saying they're indices in CI. Okay. Okay. Definitions clear. I probably started with the wrong. Did I start with the wrong board? No. Okay. Good. Okay. And uh, W star of X is the width. Of uh, v of x, and the width is you know, just what you think. It's the x the x length. Okay, and then we say x is uh, Yeah, actually, I guess I just realized I'm presenting a slightly more general thing than what one needs for what I claim because th you had, this is a slightly more general. There's not much cost in doing the more general version, in, at almost no cost, but it's what's needed when one does the, the better algorithm, which we didn't really talk about. Okay, but I'll, I'll tell you what, in what way it's more general than what we said before. So X is mu phi safe. Remember, we had mu W. If, well, x should be an element of p inverse c. So in, it should be a point in one of the boxes up there. Or, you know, x, in particular, it's in phi of x. Right. And, um, X is mu W star of X safe in U. And I haven't told you what that. Okay, and I haven't defined this for you, but mu W star F is this um, notion of what we required of a splitter. Okay, so let me let me over here just remind you what that definition. Well, I, I don't think I used the word safe before, but it's the word we use in the paper. Oh, 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 yeah, that's a that is a mu. And mu is a parameter. It's just it's a parameter b. Okay, w star of x is the width of this box. Yeah, it's just the one that didn't match the type of the box. Okay, good. So what is that? So x is uh, 
Yeah, so actually let me first define that we, we say Z is a mu W threat to X. Okay, so you have an index X and you have another index Z. We're, sitting, we're, all li we're always living in this box U. We look at the interval between X and Z. Okay, now here's P of X. The point P of X is here. I don't care about the point P of Z, but I care about this whole interval. So what's U here? What's this U? It's the whole thing. It's a box which it's either, it's initially it's everything, but later on in recursive calls, it's some box that you're focusing on. And you. Splitters have the same temperature. That's right. You, did, you chose some splitters which narrowed you down to some box or whatever that you're, you're running the algorithm recursively on this box. Okay. So once you've narrowed down to a box, one effect of that is certain indices are, rel are rendered <coughs> irrelevant. The indices whose value lies outside the box, they're kind of. They're just completely irrelevant from the point of view of that box. The only relevance is that they <coughs> might get in the way if there are too many of them. Once this set becomes too sparse, the set of things that lie in the box, you won't even find them. You won't find, but then, then you're also okay, okay, in the algorithm. All right, but here, yeah, so we have this. We have X and Z. Now what do we do? We look at all the points in here and we only care about those points in here whose value lies inside the box in this interval x to z. And we look at the number of violations with p of x. And we compare the number of violations with p of x to the total number in the box. And what do we want? We want the number of violations to be less than mu times the total number of points in here plus w, okay? Now, it's a threat if that doesn't happen, okay? So if the number of violations with um, p of x in the interval xz lying in u is at least uh, is greater than mu times the number of points of u. We have notation for all this, but I didn't introduce all this notation. The number of points of u uh, in the interval xz plus w, okay? So that's a threat and x is safe if there are no threats. So x is uh, mu w safe if there are no uh, mu w threats. Oh, in the range of u, threats uh, within x of u. Now, again, because of this w, it's easy to see that you can do this by random sample, by a, a, a random sample. Okay, but so, but at the moment, what I'm presenting is a combinatorial lemma. So I'm just saying, you know, you have, you have these things and we have, okay, this definition. All right, so now, so let's let S of uh, mu phi equal the set of mu phi safe points. And the setup we have, so the setup we have th that came from the, in the talk was that 
all of the boxes had the same width, w. So, you know, w star of x was always a constant w. So the slight generalization here is that we handled different widths, and we need to be able to do that in the, in the later on. But, um, but it doesn't really make any difference in this proof. OK, so now here's the lemma. So let's just understand the statement of the lemma. So P inverse of U minus C is just asking how many points X map outside of this chain of boxes. Okay, that's what we were, we were trying. So that the, the basic form of the dichotomy lemma was to say we wanted to show that there's at least a mu fraction of the points that lie outside of there. It's not quite true. It's not a mu fraction of all the points. P inverse U is everything, but it's everything except those ones that are safe. Okay, so it's a mu fraction of those. So you lose, so this is the way we account for the ones that you miss. You either miss them because there are a few safe points that you, you know, did your random sampling didn't find, or you miss them because they're on the edges and you're not allowed to use those. Okay, so th those are all bundled up here. When we apply, when we apply the lemma, and this will be small enough that it will, you know, it won't affect things very much. Okay. Any statements on the? Any questions on the statement? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand how you can make the number of safe points small because it's the property of the, of the array. Right? Oh, but if the number of the point is, if you find a safe point, see. See, then you're safe. So the way the algorithm works is it looks for a safe point. If it finds a safe point that's not too near the edges, if it finds even one, that becomes the splitter. And then it, it splits the problem and proceeds that way. So this, this lemma says that if you're in this situation where you didn't find a safe point, so there aren't very many, okay, then you're in this other situation where for every possible chain, no matter which chain you take, the number of points off the chain must be large. So you're good at both cases, right? I mean, if you do find a safe one, that's even better that you just split it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK. So you know, in this proof, it's, it's really pretty elementary combinatorics. It's just. Um, Anything behind? Oh wow, there's even more behind this. Yeah, I know. No, I was just wondering if there was something there. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, let's split. So if you look at the points, let the. So let's. Uh, Let's let uh, u of mu phi equal the, uh, that's probably dangerous notation. But I'll try to keep my script u's. Yeah, I have script u, I have mu, and I have capital U. That's dangerous, but uh, OK. So these are the unsafe points. You take the everybody and you Subtract the safe points. Okay. Now the unsafe points, they're unsafe. Because, what does it mean? For every x, it's unsafe means there is a z, yeah. which makes it unsafe. Now that z could be to the left of it. I mean, it, the the interval x z is either you know x is at the beginning, x is on the left. 
So I'm going to split you into. I see. So, that's, so this picture is just z could be to the left of x. Sure. Yeah, z could also be here. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, for x in u of uh, that's a mu, that's a mu mu phi. Uh, t, there is a t of x. There is a threat, which we'll call t of x. And we'll define, so we split u mu phi into L union r. Where L are those things where T of X is bigger than X, and R are those things where T of X is less than X. And what that means is that, so let's see. Here, t X is on the left. It's where a X is on the left means it's in L, and X is on the right of, of the threat if it's in R. I hesitate to use these boards because the, can people see if I use those boards? They're, this isn't blocking. No, you don't use the bottom left corner. What? Don't use the bottom left corner. Okay. All right. So um, you know, when uh, I of x is the interval. Know, x t of x or t of x x, whichever is relevant. And uh, for t contained in u of uh, u v, um, sorry, that's not. That should be a t. So for t, a subset of this, i of t is just the union of all the intervals i of x, x and t. Okay. So again, we've now we have all these unsafe points, which are most of the points. And for every unsafe point, we associate to it an interval which is starts at that either starts at that point or ends at that point. Okay. Those are the i of x's. <coughs> And then I of t, it's just a natural notation. Um, OK, now here's our, what we're going to do. And I, I, this is almost something to, to write it, to say it is much faster than to write it down. OK, I want to select subsets of L and R, L prime and R prime. And they should have the following property. L prime will be a subset of L. and when you take, and the intervals associated with the points there will be disjoint. But their union will cover all of L. OK, well, that's, if you think about it, it's the, how do you do it? I mean, it's just the dumbest algorithm, just greedily, right? You just sort of start from the left. You take the first, you take the first interval. That covers some of the points. You take the first uncovered point, and you take that one okay so we can select L prime in this way that uh, the intervals are disjoint and their union covers everything so you know choose L prime in L and R prime in R so that um, the intervals uh, I of x, x and L prime are disjoint, and the union covers L, and uh, same thing for R prime, and the union covers R. And I, did I write in the wrong place for you? 
Oh, okay. All right. <coughs> okay. Okay, so now here's our claim. And you can probably prove all these claims as I write them. So if you take anything in X, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I left out a definition. I needed some more definition. Before I write the claim, I will, st I th well, I think I'm gonna go over my time by a, a minute or two, but not much more. Um, okay, so for X and L prime union R prime, we need some definitions. So W of X is just that part of I of X, the interval of X, whose points actually lie in U. And V of X is that those guys in W of X which are actually in violation with, with X. I didn't define that set, but it's those points that are in violation with X. And what we know, remember, that we, the whole reason why we chose this was that V of X was large compared to W of X. It's at least mu times this plus the width. Okay, now V prime of X is what you get by taking V of X. Okay, now let me just draw the, show you in the picture. So maybe here's X and here's T of X. So this is the interval uh, here. Now, P of X, uh, um, something's bothering me. I think I may have. What? No, no, no. I just, I, I think in right. So, this, this is, this was a, this was an attempted simplification of the proof that we had. And no, I think it works, except that there was something that I didn't take into account. I had to separate, uh, there's something I had to separate out and I think I'm not, I may have trouble doing this on the fly, but uh, I, I think I'm gonna run into trouble. So I think I needed only, to, I wanted to be looking at the unsafe points, which are only the ones inside these boxes. So I think that the argument that I'm giving right now pertains to the unsafe points inside the boxes. Uh, but have you defined the boxes here? I mean, well, you're given, you're, given a f you're given a fixed chain of boxes. That's part of the hypothesis. Right. Oh. All right. Um, I, gotta, I have to see if I can recover here. Um, No, 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 no. The thing is that the, I mean, the unsafe points outside the boxes you get for free. I mean, if right. you're trying to count the total number of things that are outside. Okay. So if you have an unsafe point that's outside, well, it's outside. So, you know, you don't, it's, it's, it's already, you, you have that for free. So what we're trying to do is show that if you have unsafe points inside, mm -hmm. then... Uh, that associated to those unsafe points inside, 
you have to be able to find lots of points outside. I mean, not lots, but that there's corresponding to those unsafe points that are inside. So let, let, me, let me just, yeah. That's right. It has nothing to do with the chain. So you're saying the points outside the chain are at least uh, outside of every chain are right. at least a new fraction yep. of the unsafe point. Right. So um, if most points are unsafe, then that would suggest that every chain rules out. That's the whole, okay, the whole point of this dichotomy lemma was that if you don't have a good splitter, mm -hmm. then you're in a situation where every possible chain misses stuff. So this right. is, so now we have an arbitrary chain. Okay. The notion of safe is defined independent of the chain. Okay, so uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I've run out of time, but I, but I think actually what I'm saying is correct. So let me at least, uh, modulo, modulo, a, you know, a, a, a little bit of a risk. Suppose, go back to this whole definition and consider those X's which are unsafe, but actually it's intersected with C. So go back and do all this for that, okay? And then do everything I said. So that's the only change I'll make is look at the unsafe points. So every unsafe point either lies on C or is outside of C. The ones that are outside of C are good for us because we're trying to prove a lower bound yeah. on, on the inverse of U minus C. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So what we're trying to do is show is account for these and show if that if you have these guys, then this means that you will find stuff that lies outside. Okay. Um, but I admit that I'm. I'm skating on a little bit of thin ice here. Uh, okay. So V prime of X, W of X was the things in the interval I of X. You take I of X. So now the picture is this. I want to simplify to the picture that P of X is in the box. So now you have the stuff that's, you know, in this strip. You have the stuff that violates this. That means it's this stuff. And then V prime of X is the stuff that violates, but it's not in this portion. So it's not in the portion of the box. So it's V of X minus P inverse of phi of X. So it's, yeah, it's this. So if L is on the left, then this V prime of X is stuff that lies over here. And the argument is going to, we're going to try to show that V prime of X has to be big. Okay, but we can see it because V of X is big. V of X is at least mu times capital W plus W star. Now, how many points did we throw away in going from V of X to V prime of X? At most, at most W star, because W star is the width. So when we threw away this part, we threw away at most W star points. So that means that V prime of X, so note V prime of X is at least mu times W of X. Okay. Um, so we're almost done here, and in fact, I, I don't know if, if people want to. You know, I, I've I've really it, this is a two-hour talk, so going over on a two-hour talk is a terrible sin, and I'm sorry for committing it. Um, so what I'm going to do is just say that say. A word of punchline, and then if people want to continue, I'll, you know, we'll stop the talk, but then I can finish in five or ten minutes. But uh, so v prime of x is at least this. Now, remember, for we chose these x's in L prime so that all of these sets are disjoint, right? 
So now we have, you know, all these things are just, we have for every x that's in L prime, we got these disjoint sets. And we have disjoint strips where a mu fraction in that strip is, is over here. A mu fraction of all the points is over here. Okay? Um, and now the only thing you have to account for is what about the stuff that, and then the R stuff is all lying above. So you don't have any overlaps. The R stuff is going to be above here, right? So you get the things from the ones that are in L and you get the stuff that from the ones that are in R. And so that gives you that. And then what you have to do is you have to account for those portions where, um, which aren't covered by these strips. But the portions that aren't covered by these strips, all the points that are in these boxes, that are, if it's not covered, what does it mean? It's a safe point. If it's in the box, it's safe. Because the strips cover all the unsafe points that lie in boxes. So you have the safe points here, and then everything else, if there are any other points, if there are any unsafe points, they all lie outside the strips. Okay? So you have to write down the accounting properly, but the basic thing is, is this inequality and then adding it up over all the disjoint strips. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.